this fort needs some pretty serious renovating. From about 1960 to about 1995, it was open to vandalism and the weather because uh, it was simply abandoned. And Fort Adams Trust started early in on that process, trying to secure uh, stewardship because we're in a state park. And they were able to, uh, in 1995, start to secure the perimeter of the fort. And from that point on, the actual renovations began in 2001, and we're going to pass by one that's going on just today. They're putting back the Rhone Blay or the dirt back on top of the northeast demi bastion, uh, which is very exciting because that means that that wall won't fall down for about another 200 years. <coughs> so, the other thing I had mentioned was that John Weaver's book about the legacy in brick and stone, and this is part of the third system of fortifications. And in 1639, when Newport was founded, they came along here and they discovered that this harbor here is 130 feet deep, which means you can pull any size ship in here you want to. And if I can get anything across in my tour, it's the whole idea that back in 1639, all the way up until about 1870, the only way to move anything of any size from one place to another was sailing vessel. So in 1776, some uninvited guests showed up called the British, and they ended up occupying Newport for three years. They were here until 1779, and they treated the people of Newport pretty badly. They were, uh, by 1779, over half the population had left. By 1779, something happened, and the British rather unexpectedly pulled out. Turns out, they heard things were going badly down south. And chasing them from Jamestown across the bay was George Washington and General Rochambeau, our French ally, and chased them all the way down to Yorktown, where we threw them out of our country the first time. Well, the British weren't happy with that. And the Americans said, we better do something about this. So they built the first Fort Adams right, right out here in the north part, 20 guns. Uh, and it was in a battery with Fort Hamilton, which is over where these condos are, Fort Walcott over on Rose Island, Fort Dumplings over in Jamestown. Point that out when we get on top. It kept everybody out of the bay, but it didn't keep the British from burning down Washington. In 1814, the British marched into Washington, D.C. and burnt down the Capitol, burnt down the White House, chased everybody out. So after we beat them again in 1815, Congress got together and said, never again. So, 1820 Fortifications Committee came up with 42 sites, 40 sites along the East Coast, two in San Francisco for the third system's fortification. We're going to go into a fort that is the second largest after Fort Monroe in Virginia, but it's the most complex by far. 468 cannon, could house up to 2,400 men, and it has features in here that exist nowhere else in North America, and which, if you choose to do so, we'll go in some of those things. But right now, we're going to head up to the fort. Did that, so what, was it functioning up to 60? It was functioning up as a, uh, in 1950, the Army gave it to the Navy. The Navy kept it till 1954, didn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Then from 54 to 60, from what I understand, there were offices for the coastal artillery, Army coastal artillery here. 1958, uh, President Eisenhower came to visit, and according to the story, he came here, he stayed at the Eisenhower house south of here a couple of summers. And he was taking a walk around, and I'm not sure if this part's true or not, but something like one of the aides said, well, Mr. President, we're going to have to tear this place down because it had outlived its usefulness. Mm -hmm. And the president said, no. Mm -hmm. Too many people had been stationed here and so forth. Threw some money at it until 1960, and then it was just simply abandoned. I mean, they just pulled out. That was that. And so, I mean, we have I have friends of mine who came here during that period, and, I mean, there were still cookware in the kitchens mm. that, that had just been abandoned. They, they kind of just up and left. So by 95 then, the Fort Adams Trust as we know it today, had secured uh, the stewardship of the fort and was able to, at that point, start to secure it. You're going to see some pretty serious vandalism in here. And we're, of course, not going in there. But the other part of it is too, is the west wall that faces the most important wall, that faces the East Passage, uh, was abandoned fairly early. Because the other part about this is, think about 1865. Well, this was, you know, first garrison 1841. 1865, monitored in Merrimack. Ironclad ships, steam engines, and this became even more obsolete. 468 guns were disposed of, and by 1880, 
all of those guns should turn to five batteries south of here, 26 cannon. So this was a victim of the times, of its position, because no war took place. I did its job. It was right. a deterrent. <laughs> but uh, it was never fired upon. So well, let's head up to the fort. Yeah. All right. Absorb a, a mortar round falling on top of it. That's eight feet thick. Wow. So these, these walls are five feet thick, made out of granite and so forth. And the grass, you said? Well, if you take a look up there, if you're coming from, you know, there was no aerial view in 1824. If you're coming here, you, you see there's something there, but you don't realize it's one of the most complex fortifications in North America in 1824. And we're heading toward the first line of defense, which is this escarpment, this hill. This used to extend all the way across. And this building in front of us is called the Redoubt. This is the first line of defense. It used to be one, uh, one story. That one story was hidden behind the escarpment. If we had got to this point and the fellas up there said halt, and we did not, they'd simply shoot us. We're entering what's called an active killing zone. Hmm. In about 1867, the second floor was added. Now these are the offices for the Fort Adams Trust. The bottom part uh, turned, was turned into a jail. The guards lived up on top, prisoners down here. But as you walk past those, uh, as we go past these five uh, far barred windows, you can see that there are active rifle positions. Originally defensive. Does anybody here speak French? Good, because my French is terrible. But the guy who designed this place was French. So you're going to hear a lot of French terms like bastion and enceinte and romble. Romble simply means dirt. But as I mentioned, there is a rifle slit. As we approach the enceinte, which is this main wall, like I said, these walls are five feet thick. They're made of granite. When we get up here, you'll see behind some of these rifle ports, the whole idea here is if you have a five foot thick wall and you're shooting a musket, which would have been the first rifle used, what happens is you have a limited angle of view. If you saw something moving during those periods of time, you shot it or shot at it. But what I couldn't see, the guy next to me could, the guy next to him, the guy next to him. There is no angle unobserved from all of these positions. A cannon abrasure. Those are the arched windows. There would have been a howitzer up there, and had we gotten this far, it would have shot canister. Canister is basically a pile of shards of glass, nails, and metal. It is non-discriminatory toward tissue. It will tear apart anything it hits. Uh, the stories from the Civil War where they use canister are just god-awful, as any war is. But in this case, it's not they couldn't identify the bodies. They could not identify body parts. That's how serious this stuff is. All of these would have been loaded with canister. The huge windows were actually um, rifle ports. But in the 1880s, this really didn't need it anymore from this defensive position, so they opened up for better ventilation and big windows. And they, they there is always a breeze in this posture, which in the summertime is great. But you'll notice, here are the three components of what they built this place up. You're standing on granite from Maine. The grooves were cut to provide traction for the soldiers and for the animals coming up. In the walls is shale, and the shale was really cheap because they dug it up right here. Uh, and then brick, lots and lots and lots of brick. Four million brick were used in the construction here. One of the most important aspects about some of the brick is up here in the embrasure. If that were five feet thick of granite, it's just gonna, you know, the cannonball's gonna bounce off of it anyway. But on this side, it could actually create splinters or a little shards. And so it could have gotten in the faces, the eyes, and the bodies of the cannoneer on this side. So the guy who built this place came up with the idea of unfired brick, that soft brick. 
If a cannonball were to hit the other side, it would simply bounce off. But instead of sending out shards of granite, it just created dust. Hmm. So the guy's going to sneeze rather than go blind. Hmm. So question number four on your test, shale, granite, and brick. Mm -hmm. Let's head up to the parade. How oh. big it is, it's six and a half acres. You may have heard of Fort McHenry, Fort Ticonderoga, Fort Sumter. They would all fit inside here, hmm. all three forts. The graphic here kind of shows that. This poor graphic is in the windiest spot and gets knocked over. It was actually on this post here, on a post here, and we had a nor'easter here a couple weeks ago. Knocked the whole thing over. Hmm. But anyway, McHenry, Ticonderoga, and Sumter. Wow. The fellow in the picture there is Simone Bernard, who is the major architect of this place. He was a uh, uh, aide-de-camp to Napoleon in France, and when Napoleon was deposed for the second time, Bernard came to the United States. The United States Army hired him immediately, made him a major. He became a brigadier general in about six months. But he is the main architect for many of the system, uh, third system's fortifications. And you're going to see things here that are 100% French. In fact, there are a couple structures here that exist only here in North America. If you wanted to go see some of this stuff, you'd have to go to France. So Simone Bernard designed the place, but an American guy built it. So when, when you say third system, what does that really mean? There are five systems of fortifications. The first system would be sort of like Fort Ticonderoga, you know, actually a British fort back when we were still a colony. The second system would have been the original Fort Adams, which would have been Fort Adams, Fort Hamilton, or, yeah, Hamilton, Walcott, Dumplings, uh, you know, early, early 18th century. Third system was when they got serious. <laughs> third system is... Um, and this is all historian architecture kind of talk here, uh, and there's a great deal of debate. I'm listening to John Weaver, who wrote the book about this place. Third system is from 1820 into the late 1860s, probably. And then the, there is a fourth and fifth system, and you can probably consider the fifth system nuclear weapons, I guess. So it's just a whole idea that uh, different systems of defense. And so this part of the third system was designed to repel any attack from any direction given what would possibly attack. So, I mean, if you think about this in a Scud missile attack, you're not going to be able to stop it given the armament here. However, if you had a British man of war coming up the East Passage, they have to get 117 cannon here, and they're not going to. So that's pretty much what the third system is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Totten. Uh, Totten showed up in 1825. There's two Fort Tottens, one at the base of the Throgsneck Bridge in Queens. The other is in North Dakota. Colonel Totten, uh, by the way, if you were studying engineering at West Point, you came here to study with him. Uh, those brick embrasures, that was his idea, the, the soft brick. You're going to see a few other Totten-esque ideas throughout the fort. But when he got here, the first thing he noticed is he looked at the plans and was probably duly impressed because it is massive. But he said, you don't have enough people to build it. And, you know, looking at that, he was looking at a timeline of maybe, you know, 33 years. So he ended up sending over to Ireland, and he hired over 400 Irish laborers. Fellas came over here, most, some with their families. They were promised a decent wage, and they were promised a place to stay. And I believe they were actually promised American citizenship if they, you know, stuck it out. And they also brought along with them Roman Catholicism. And there were no Catholics in Rhode Island at the time. And so the fellows up, uh, the diocese up in Boston bought them a little schoolhouse so they could worship, and they outgrew it. And within a generation or two, they ended up building St. Mary's Church, which is the corner of Spring Street and Memorial Boulevard, which, of course, is best known for where John Kennedy was married in 1953 to Jacques Bouvier. Um, and if you're not familiar with Newport and its Irish American heritage, it's pretty formidable. Driving in through the Fifth Ward today, I spotted at least three Irish flags flying next to American flags. People here take their Irish heritage very seriously. 
all of the guides here are members of, most of the guides are members of the uh, Ancient Order of Hibernians, which is the Irish American Club. My family is Scottish. Kind of ticks me off here because it doesn't say anything here about the guy, the Master Mason, Alexander McGregor, a Scotsman. Mm -hmm. No, we got all the Irish guys up here. Make sure we get them. Make sure you get Totten up here. So, where's McGregor's name? Nowhere. So, uh, I've, I've lodged my complaint many, many times. Four million bricks. Bricks were made in Rhode Island. And we just had some folks from Pepperell, Massachusetts. And there was a brickyard there. They may have been made there as well. So, that Massachusetts, Rhode Island bricks, main granite, shale came right out of here, out of uh, the peninsula we're standing on. And we take a look at this, some of this stuff is just astounding. Linear feet, 0.59 miles, that's how many linear feet of wall there is here. You know, it's just, it's enormous, or 1824 to 1857. Mm -hmm. So let's take a walk around the corner here, and we're headed toward the officer's quarters. 